This is the fourth session of the course on the Byzantine Empire, and this is called The Age of Justinian, colon, The Hand of God, which is quite a good provisional title for this set of slides, as I hope you'd agree as we go through them. Let's begin where we sort of ended last week. This is the general situation of the Eastern Empire in much of the 5th century. You have the purple area, here called the Byzantine Empire, which should perhaps be called the Eastern Empire at this time, certainly at least at this time. In the West, you have a rapidly disintegrating Western Roman Empire. You have a rather quiet Persian Empire in the East, that great red area. And the Persian Empire is not terribly aggressive, not terribly active at this time. To the north you have the Huns, and these are a continual problem. A problem which must be managed in various ways, and preferably managed not by military action, partly because the Empire doesn't really want to raise the kind of military forces that could take on the Huns, also because the Empire doesn't on the whole believe that it can take on the Huns. They're just too scary. So the Huns are dealt with by persuading them to go and do their raping, plundering, burning and general troublemaking somewhere else, which means in the West. So this is the Empire as it emerges into the 6th century. This is a very important map. I showed this to you last week. It is a map of the utmost importance because in the east it shows the fault lines in the empire. The yellow areas can be taken as areas of untroubled orthodox belief, whereas those stripy areas, those are mixed, and they're mixed in a highly peculiar way. The cities Aleppo, Damascus, Jerusalem, Alexandria, Caesarea, Beritus or Beirut. All of these cities, Greek in language, and they are orthodox in religion, or at least orthodox on the whole. They are islands of Greek orthodoxy or of Greek Catholicism. They amount to the same things at this time. They are seas of Greek orthodox Catholicism in what amount to seas of Semitic heresy, because outside the city what you have is overwhelmingly Syriac, Aramaic, Coptic and other similar languages spoken by people whose religious inclinations are towards a single nature for Christ. And you can ask, so what? You know, does it matter how many natures Christ has, if he has one, two or five? Does it make any difference? And the answer is yes, it does make a difference when people think it's important. And so these are fault lines in the empire that must be dealt with. You can deal with them in two ways. You can persecute people long enough and hard enough to hope that they will see the light of reason and convert to your particular conception of the nature of Christ, or you can go very quiet on the whole thing and insist that the matter is not to be discussed. That is the policy followed by the empire in most of the 5th century. Justinian takes over sometime between 518, when his uncle becomes emperor, and 527, when he succeeds his uncle. Justinian takes over his ambition appears to be twofold. First, he wants to reconquer the lost Western territories of the empire. Second, and this may not be in any particular order, but second, you have to put something first and something second. Second, he wants to ensure that the empire he rules is orthodox in its faith, which puts him into immediate conflict with the great majority of people in Egypt and Syria and in conflict with significant minorities in other parts of the empire. This does not seem a 
very significant difficulty at the outset. Egypt and Syria are largely at peace. Although the government may make ferocious noises about heresy, it probably lacks the administrative infrastructure for serious long-term persecution. That is my belief, which may well be wrong, but although the empire would like to persecute, and although the empire does from time to time persecute, it is unable to do so with the kind of efficiency that you see in the governments of early modern Europe. You can tell that by looking at the almost complete failure of the anti-Christian persecutions. When it comes to military expansion in the West, the first problem that the empire has to face is that there is a large and powerful Persian empire in the east. The empire has no territorial ambitions at all in the east, except perhaps to make sure that some of these little territories in the northeastern areas, Lazica, Armenia, Albania, not the Albania, but an, an Albania, that these areas remain friendly to the empire, but it is generally accepted that they will be buffer states. They are a neutral zone. The empire's main interest is to make sure that they remain friendly to the empire without necessarily being satellites of the empire. The Persian ambition, however, is an outlet to the Mediterranean. Sometimes the Persians talk in a rather grandiloquent way about restoring the empire of Darius the Great and of Xerxes. Mostly they're just interested in getting an outlet to the Mediterranean because, well, it's a fine sea on which to have an outlet. That's the eastern situation. Mostly there is peace along the frontier. The Persians themselves face external threats and neither side particularly wants a war with the other. However, war does break out in 527, and it carries on until 532. So Justinian's first years as emperor are spent dealing with the eastern frontier, and what goes in the, on in the west is something over which he has no present control. But the war is settled in 532, neither side wins, Justinian wants peace rather more than the Persians do, so he blinks first and he agrees to pay a subsidy. But the Persians accept that and for the moment go away. What's going on in the West? Two important successor states to the Western Roman Empire. In 428, the Vandals, a Germanic tribe, cross the Straits of Gibraltar and conquer Africa. They set up their capital in Carthage, which before then had been the provincial capital, and they make their North African kingdom into the greatest naval power in the Western Mediterranean. Much attention has been given by historians to the fact that they are pirates. And if you want a pirate base in the Mediterranean, we do know from no experience that North Africa is a very fine place to have one. But the Vandals are a great deal more than pirates, barbarian pirates who got lucky by creeping across the Straits of Gibraltar and taking advantage of a somewhat careless Roman administration. During the century of Vandal rule in North Africa, what you have is a complete merger of Roman and barbarian. The Barbarians, the Vandals, let's call them, give up eventually on the use of their own language. They adopt Roman ways, they adopt Latin as their main language, and they fit themselves into the existing structures of the North African provinces. So much so that, as I said, there is a pretty near complete fusion of North Africans and Vandals at the top and a long way down. North Africa is liberated from imperial rule. It is not so much snatched out of the empire as liberated from imperial rule because it is no longer necessary to send 
millions of bushels of corn across the Mediterranean every year to keep Rome fed. The food can be used at home. The tax money that previously was remitted across the Mediterranean can be spent at home. We don't have a lot of evidence about the century of Vandal rule after 428, but what evidence we do have is of continuity and prosperity. The overall picture of Vandal rule in North Africa is of prosperity and peace. The Vandals are Aryan Christians, that is, they believe that the father is superior to the son. This occasionally results in persecutions, and there is an entire literature describing the terrible sufferings of the Catholic Church in North Africa at this time. This is not to be entirely discounted, but on the other hand, the degree of persecution alleged in this literature is so great that it's likely to have snuffed out Catholicism within five years, whereas for year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation, the most horrifying atrocities are committed against all the bishops who are continually deposed but the bishops continue to exist in their sees and their churches continue to exist to be burned. Either the churches are burned every year and rebuilt every year and then burned again, or there is a degree of exaggeration. Whatever the case, the Vandals rule North Africa for more than a century, and for the last 50 years of their rule of Africa, they are accepted as the legitimate rulers of those territories by the governments in Constantinople. There are friendly diplomatic and commercial links between the Empire and the Vandals. The Vandals believe, by the 530s, that they are the accepted legitimate rulers of Africa, they are accepted and regarded as legitimate by the people of North Africa, and the empire itself is quite happy to accept them as partners in various endeavours. It's the same in Italy, but more so. After the last Roman emperor in the West is deposed in 476, Italy is ruled by various barbarian warlords, Eventually, Theodoric the Great becomes the barbarian warlord. He has a formal position in the imperial hierarchy. He is accepted as the Eastern Emperor's man in Italy. As such, he has a piece of paper that he can wave in front of the Italians. Not that the Italians need much encouragement, because Theodoric and his Gothic armies are very useful people to have around. They are civilised, they are tolerant, although they are themselves Aryans, they are unwilling to persecute the Italians for their Catholicism. At the same time, the Goths ensure that no other barbarians are able to invade Italy. And so... Italy is in a flourishing state after about 476. The end of Roman imperial rule in Italy is not attended by the emptying out of the cities and the burning of libraries and all the usual things alleged against the barbarian invaders. It is completely unnoticed. Cities like Rome, Milan, Naples... They continue flourishing exactly as before. The Senate continues to meet in Rome. One consul is appointed every January in Rome and another in Constantinople. Because Theodoric is the, is the emperor's man, he is the emperor's regent in Italy. And so Theodoric appoints the Western consul. It's that kind of arrangement. The East accepts that the Western Empire has come to an end and that Italy is ruled by Theodoric, a barbarian, and that North Africa is ruled by Gaiseric and his various successors. 
that at the beginning of Justinian's reign is the pattern of diplomatic relationships between the most important areas of the West and the Eastern Empire. Justinian has absolutely no interest in continuing this set of relationships. In 532, Justinian takes advantage of a falling out within the Vandal royal house. He sends his great general Belisarius west to Africa with about 15,000 men. They land in what is now Tunisia and they defeat the Vandals in two battles and within a few weeks Belisarius has taken Carthage itself and North Africa has fallen. The African provinces have been recovered for the empire. It is possible to say, well, this shows the weakness of Vandal rule. Two battles with a very small army of 15,000 imperial soldiers and the whole structure collapses. That's what happened. However, in his history of the war to recover Africa, Procopius does mention that on one occasion it was necessary, or perhaps whether it was necessary or not is beside the point, Belisarius felt it necessary to get hold of one of the Roman landowners and impale him because he had sided with the Vandals. There is some evidence that the imperial armies were not welcomed as liberators by everybody in North Africa, and that the Vandals had been the preferred rulers. That is something that comes out from a careful reading of Procopius. Whatever the case, the Vandals have been defeated, Africa has been returned to the empire as a province, not of the Western Empire now, but as a province of the undivided empire ruled by Justinian from Constantinople. The Vandal king, Gelimer, is taken off to Constantinople and he is paraded around the Hippodrome in a triumphal procession. In the pagan empire, he might have been taken off afterwards and strangled in the temple of Hercules. This is the Christian empire, however, so Gelimer is pensioned off. He's given a house outside Constantinople and left to live out the rest of his life in peace. At the same time, you have the capture of Sardinia, Corsica, the Balearic Islands, and there may also have been a movement into Spain across Gibraltar. We're not entirely sure about the nature and the extent of the imperial reconquest in Spain. You cannot speak of an imperial reconquest of Spain there was, it seems, an imperial reconquest in Spain. How much territory was taken and for how long it was held, those we just don't know. But that's the end of Africa, and it seems to be working. Justinian has set himself the mission of reconquering the lost provinces of the West. His first attempt, he takes the whole of Africa in two battles. The whole thing pays for itself with the tax revenues from Africa. Next on his list is Italy. And here, again, it seems to go well at first. When Theodoric dies, his relatives fall out and Italy becomes more or less unstable. It doesn't have a very stable government in Ravenna. In 535, Belisarius, the great general, invades Sicily. He jumps across the water from Carthage to Sicily. He takes Sicily, hurries through, jumps across the Straits of Messina into Italy proper, and he races up the peninsula, taking Naples without a serious battle. He then gets to Rome, where the Senate opens the gates, and it seems that Italy is falling in much the way as Africa does. However, as the imperial armies move further north, they begin to meet stronger and stronger resistance. 
I'm not able to talk about the differences in detail between the Vandals and the Goths, but it does seem that the Goths, maybe just as much as, or maybe more than, it's, as I said, impossible to say, but it does seem that the Goths did not regard themselves as the occupiers of Italy. They had been in Italy, on and off, for the better part of a hundred years, and they regard Italy as their homeland, and they regard the imperial armies led by Belisarius as an alien conquest of their homeland. They are in no position, for whatever reason, to put up much resistance in the south of the country, and they give up Rome without a battle. But as I said, as the imperial armies press further and further north in Italy, they meet stronger resistance, and this resistance turns bitter, and what began as a war of swift movement turns into a war of sieges and losses and victories and losses and victories and marches and countermarches. Not good things if you happen to be a civilian living in the middle of them. Resistance is extraordinarily bitter. Rome is taken by the imperial armies and then lost by the imperial armies and then retaken and lost. Rome is taken and lost by each side five times between 536 and 552. When the imperial armies walked into Rome in 536, they found a large and flourishing city. They found Rome with the Senate and all the buildings intact and a large population completely unaccustomed to any kind of war. By 552, when the imperial armies walked into Rome for the last time, they walked into a city that was a burned out shell. The population appears to have fallen from something like a third of a million to maybe 30,000. At some time during those sieges and counter sieges, all of the aqueducts were cut, and so the baths no longer worked, and Rome was now reliant once again on the Tiber. The whole of the Senate had been taken prisoner by the Goths and massacred, and all of their children had been taken prisoner by the Goths, and they had been massacred. And all of the libraries in the city were destroyed. They were open to the elements, and still being largely papyrus, they disintegrated, a bit like leaving rolls of kitchen towel out in the rain. Rome is a good example of what these wars did to Italy. They turned Rome and Italy from a territory which had navigated the transition from Roman to barbarian rule without any loss of the civic culture of late antiquity into a desert. Justinian has received much blame from this. The devastation of the reconquest of Italy, which is ultimately successful, is so great that Italy does not recover until about 1100. However, it is possible to put too much blame on Justinian for the disasters that we see in Italy. It's part of human vanity to blame everything that happens to us on human choices and human actions. If only Justinian had not decided on his reconquest of Italy, then Italy would have continued through the Middle Ages as a garden. There is no reason to believe that. There is no doubt that his policy of expansion has produced imperial overstretch. There's no doubt that his reconquest of Italy has been a disaster. But there are other events, and we don't know what these events were exactly. 536 was a year without a summer. The accounts of that year talk about a year without a summer. The sun hides behind a continual haze. 
the crops fail all over the Mediterranean world and yields may have been low for several years after that. You can see this in various saint lives, in various chronicles. There is a Syriac chronicle, I believe, which mentions this. You can see it mentioned in various imperial laws which talk about the remission of unpaid taxes to take account of the fact that people were in no position to pay their taxes because of the failure of all the harvests. We know that this happened, but we don't know why it happened. Some people believe that there was a small asteroid impact, maybe in the southern hemisphere. That would have sent up a lot of dust into the atmosphere. A less glamorous theory, which is becoming the consensus, is that it was a volcano in Iceland. I have spoken about this on numerous occasions in the past, but not in this course. There was a volcanic eruption in Iceland in 1784, and we're able to measure the effects of this across the world. We're able to see the silica cloud that blotted out the main heat of the sun for 18 months. You can read about it in newspaper reports in England, in Western Europe, in North America. We can look at things like the failure of the Egyptian harvests. We can look at the failure of grain harvests in most of Western Europe. We can look at the increased number of deaths in the winters of 70, in the winter of 1784 to 5, deaths which included Dr. Johnson, who died of breathing difficulties. We can look at the economic recession that followed the Icelandic volcano and the increasing financial strains felt by the French treasury, which culminated in a bankruptcy in 1788 and the summoning for 1789 of the States General. We're able to look at the effects of a major volcanic eruption at a time when we have full records. If there was a similar volcanic eruption, again in Iceland, in 536, we can expect that the results would also have been substantial, and it seems they were. There was a volcanic eruption in 536. We seem to have evidence for that in the ice core samples and the tree ring records. There seems to have been another volcanic eruption somewhere else on the planet in 542, six years later. This produced the coldest decade in the past 2,000 years. So the first volcanic eruption, assuming that that was the so, dims the sun for 18 months and summer temperatures drop by 1.5 to 2.5 degrees centigrade. Then you have a second volcanic eruption about six years later and summer temperatures again drop by one and a half, two and a half degrees centigrade. So this is the coldest decade on record in 2000 years Crops fail all over the world. And here at the bottom right of this slide, you have a reconstruction of temperatures. You can see this downward notch centering on the year 536. Can you all see that? Yes. Now the effects of this, it's not just that it causes crops to fail here, there and everywhere for a few years. What it may have done is to set in motion a great migration of black rats, which are native to Eastern Central Asia. The black rats appear to have moved south because of the cooling temperatures. Their own normal habitat was less friendly to them than it had been. They moved south into the more temperate climates. They moved south into China. And of course, what do black rats bring with them? They bring fleas. And what do the fleas have? The fleas carry a bacillus called Yersinia pestis. It used to be called Pastorella pestis. It seems that plague, bubonic plague, breaks out first in China, and then it moves along the trade routes. A question. I'm asked whether this was the first 
great outbreak of bubonic plague. There may have been one in the early Bronze Age, around 3000 BC, but we don't know much about that. This is the first global pandemic of which we have written evidence. It moved along the trade routes, and it moved very quickly on the trade routes. Within a year, it had moved from the southern ports of China into the Mediterranean world. According to Procopius, it first showed itself in Pelusium, which is a port in Egypt. From there, it spread straight to Constantinople and then throughout the rest of the Mediterranean world. You can go too far in blaming the plague for everything that happened, but there is a very good case for blaming it. We have the accounts of Procopius and of other historians. When the plague turned up in Constantinople, it is said to have killed 10,000 a day, every day for 100 days. You can discount that. It didn't do that. And we know because the past 18 months have involved a series of long lessons in epidemiology, the study of plagues. What we know is that when a new infection hits a population, the deaths, or the infections and deaths, produce a bell curve. A sudden upward swing in infections and death, a peak and then a decline and a long tail. So 10,000 a day for 100 days is not very likely. The curves just don't look like that. Also, it's hard to say that the population of Constantinople was that large. But other things reported by Procopius are entirely credible, that nobody knew where to bury the bodies. There were so many of them. Some bodies were loaded onto barges and set to float and land where they would. Some bodies were bricked up inside the voids of the city walls so that when the wind shifted you could smell the rotting of tens or hundreds of thousands of dead. The bodies piled up in the streets. The emperor himself caught the plague. You can repeat this through all the other cities of the empire and of the Mediterranean. It may have killed 40% of the Mediterranean population. This, of course, would have a fundamental impact on the society and economy of the Mediterranean world. It would be a much poorer Mediterranean world and well, a much smaller Mediterranean world. However, look at those eastern shaded areas. So long as Alexandria is a large Greek city, and so long as Damascus is also a large Greek city, and Antioch and all the others, it is possible to say that Egypt and Syria are Orthodox Christian Greek areas, which just happen to have a mass of non-Greek and non-Orthodox people in the countryside. If you define these areas by their cities, they are Greek areas, which is what they have been since the time of Alexander the Great, a thousand years earlier. However, the ecology of these cities was rather delicate, and we're able to say this because of what we know about the transformations in cities like Prague in Central Europe during the 19th century. What we know about cities like Prague, Olmutz, Carlsbad and many other cities in Central Europe during the 19th century is this. Until about 1850, cities were net consumers of humanity. The death rate was always larger than the birth rate. And so the cities had to reproduce themselves, not internally, but by attracting immigrants from the surrounding countryside. Yet in Central Europe, throughout the 18th century and into the 19th century, the cities were overwhelmingly German. You could travel from one German city to another German city, never noticing that people in the countryside didn't speak German. So Prague, let's take Prague as our example. Prague, until 1850, is a German city. 
And if you, a Czech speaker from outside, move into Prague to take advantage of the economic opportunities there, you will find it necessary to learn German so that you can deal with your potential customers or your employers. If you are a successful immigrant, if you start a business that does well, you'll make sure that your sons go to school and that they learn German. They learn to read it and write it and speak it. And perhaps they'll speak Czech at home, but they might not. If the family business continues to be successful, their children will be brought up speaking only German. And so German remained the language of cities like Prague for several hundred years, even though these cities existed in an area that was overwhelmingly Czech because of the nature of slow immigration into those cities. What destroyed this balance after 1850 was the unlimited growth of European cities. The death rate fell and it meant that more and more people moved into these central European cities and it got to the point where it was no longer necessary to learn German and forget Czech. You had the emergence of Czech districts and German districts and what have you. And so the careful balance that had maintained German domination in the central European cities from the 17th to 19th centuries was overturned by unlimited demographic growth in the late 19th century. And it seems that something similar happened in the Near East. You are a Coptic speaker. You move into Alexandria. You do well. And so you send your sons to a school where they learn Greek. They grow up speaking Greek and Coptic. Their children are brought up speaking only Greek. Eventually your bloodline will fail because, as I said, the cities are net consumers of humanity. But the process will continue with other immigrants. And so for a thousand years, between the conquest by Alexander and the plague of Justinian, cities like Alexandria, Antioch, Damascus, Caesarea, you name it, have maintained themselves as Greek islands in a Semitic sea by something like this process. It seems that the plague hit the cities harder than the country districts. The cities had much smaller populations and so a tipping point was much more easily reached. What we notice after the plague is that the government in Constantinople begins to issue laws saying, yes, the town council in Aleppo can conduct its business in Syriac from now on. Greek is no longer necessary. The records don't need to be kept in Greek. You can keep the records in Syriac or Aramaic so long as you continue dealing with the capital in Greek. What that suggests is that the number of Greek-speaking people in the higher classes is no longer sufficient to maintain the town administrations and it is necessary to allow in people who do not know any Greek. Again, you see something like this in England after the Black Death. Until the Black Death, the official language in England was French. The language of law and administration was French. After the Black Death, there was a shortage of French teachers and within a short period after the Black Death, the official language had switched to English. Now, what does this mean for the eastern provinces, for Syria and Egypt? What it means is that these stripes are rubbed out. What you now have is the virtual disappearance of yellow from those areas. They now become almost overwhelmingly monophysite. And not just Monophysite, they become Syriac and Aramaic and Coptic-speaking Monophysites. They are no longer within the civilization of the Eastern Empire. They're still subjects of the Emperor, they still pay their taxes to Constantinople, and 
they are still loyal in the political sense to the emperor because they have been ruled from Constantinople or from Rome or by Greek speakers for a thousand years. They have no conception of independence. They have no idea that any different existence is possible. But they have dropped out of the cycle of imperial civilization, and that may be one of the main effects of the plague. You could look at the far west of this area, you could look at Britain, and we know very little about what was happening in our own part of the world at this time, but it is possible to say that a sub-Roman civilization is maintained in at least the south of England until the middle of the 6th century, after which the Angles and Saxons, who had invaded and have so far been held back from southern England, they now roll forward. Could that be an effect of the plague? I don't know. It's a possibility. So let me summarise what's happened. Justinian's reconquest of Italy would always have been a much harder thing than his reconquest of Africa. But what turned an embarrassment into a catastrophe was a set of external events that nobody could have predicted and that nobody could possibly at the time understand. The external events were a small asteroid impact, that's my personal preference because I have a liking for such things, but more likely it was an Icelandic volcano that erupted in 536 and perhaps the same or a different volcano that erupted five or six years later that produced a dropping of temperatures and this fits in with a long-term downward trend in temperatures in any event. Lower temperatures produced crop failures and famines. Lower temperatures also produced a migration of black rats from what were now the colder climates of North Central Asia into China itself. They brought the plague with them this then spread along the trade routes from China to every other part of the Old World. Arriving in the Mediterranean world in 542 and then wiping out perhaps 40% of the Mediterranean population. This is the great disaster. I'm not saying that Justinian was entirely without blame. He launched his wars of reconquest at the wrong time. If he had stayed in Constantinople and spent his entire life trying to settle the Monophysite controversy, evil times would still have fallen on his empire and on the Mediterranean world, but his attempted reconquest of the West just as the environment turned against him added catastrophe to catastrophe. And that is what Justinian appears to have done. Let me continue with this. We should not regard the plague as a single event. When these plagues begin, they are hardly ever a single event that passes. They are usually the beginning of a process. We know this by looking at the Black Death when it hit Europe in the late 1340s. It is not the case that the bubonic plague ripped through Europe 1347 to 1349, what have you, and then went away, leaving a third of the population dead and whatever recovery then set in. No, that is not at all what happened. The plague kept coming back every 15 to 20 years. And it continued coming back again and again until the 1660s, when it went. It went as mysteriously as it came. I think the last great outbreak of plague in Western Europe was at Marseille in 1720. After that, plague just withdrew itself from the Western Mediterranean. It remained endemic in the Eastern Mediterranean until 
I think the 1850s after which it disappeared. Something to do with warming temperatures, I'm told. Now, this is what happened after 542. The plague kept coming back. It returned every generation, every 15, every 20 years. The last big visitation of plague in the Eastern Empire, which I know, was in 719, just after the second Arab siege of Constantinople. And this appears to have hit with such force that the Greek language largely disappeared from mainland Greece and the Greek dialects themselves die out so that when Greek is eventually reintroduced into the territories of modern Greece, it is the language spoken in Constantinople, not a continuator of the languages spoken in Greece since the end of the Bronze Age. So that is what happened. That is the great disaster in the time of Justinian. It was not all a question of losers. There were some winners. Remember how after our own Black Death, it drove wages up for agricultural workers. You still had the same amount of land that must be planted and cultivated, but you now have a shortage of the people to do the planting and the and the harvesting, and so wages were driven upwards. Although Parliament tried to legislate to prevent increases in wages, you cannot abolish market forces by an Act of Parliament. So the Black Death had its winners as well as its losers. The losers were those who died, and of course those who suddenly found that they were no longer paying a penny a day, but threepence a day for agricultural workers. And it seems to have been the case in the empire. There is evidence looking at the archaeological examinations of the use of land. There is evidence for a burst of sudden prosperity in the Syrian farming districts. People still need to eat, and those people who are able to produce food will find a ready market. Because although maybe 40% of the population is dead, 60% of the population is still alive, and since the amount of food produced before the beginning of the epidemic was just about adequate to keep that 100% on the edge of starvation, it means that there is more food to go around among the surviving 60%, and there is a ready market for that food as well. But although you can identify winners from this process, the overall effects were catastrophic. And it's not Justinian's fault, but his policies didn't help matters. Now, the end. Here's a nice picture. Belisarius begging for arms in the marketplace. There is a story of questionable provenance that in his old age, Justinian suspected his general Belisarius of plotting against him. So he had Belisarius arrested, deprived of all his possessions, stripped of all his ranks, and blinded and cast out into the streets, where he was guided about by his daughter, begging for pennies in the marketplace. Here is a representation of this by Jacques-Louis David, 1781, somewhat unlikely. Whatever the case, though, Justinian died in 565 as a lonely old man. His wife predeceased him by nearly 20 years. He is obsessed by theological controversies which he is completely unable to settle. The taxes are not coming in despite the best endeavours of his rapacious revenue collectors. The best he can do to protect the empire from being overrun by its various enemies is to bribe them. Passive defences, walls, fortresses, and bribery, and subsidy diplomacy, I think, is the respectful name for it. Here's a mention by Gaetheus, 580. 
The Roman armies had not in fact remained at the desired level attained by the earlier emperors, but had dwindled to a fraction of what they had been and were no longer adequate to the requirements of a vast empire. And whereas there should have been a totally effective fighting force of 645,000 men, the number had dropped during this period to barely 150,000 men. You can expect that to be broadly true. 40% of the population is dead, and it takes a while for population to recover from that kind of shock. There will be a shortage of men to enlist in the armies. There will be a shortage of taxpayers to pay for them. Justinian presides over an empty treasury, empty armies, and an empire with borders that are too large to be effectively maintained. Here are two maps. The map on the left is a map of the empire at the accession of Justinian. You can see that the Eastern Empire is much the same as it had been since the time of Augustus. The Western Empire has disappeared. It is a patchwork of barbarian kingdoms. The map on the right is of the empire at the death of Justinian, and it is an apparently much expanded empire. I'm not sure how much of southern Spain the empire had managed to reconquer, probably not as much as shown on this map, but some of it. And all the worthwhile bits of North Africa, and Italy, and the islands in the Mediterranean. But this is a hollowed out empire with monstrously overextended frontiers. Now, in the year of Justinian's death, 565, there is someone born in Mecca. And he is a man of decided religious leanings. And in his middle life, and one must always be objective in talking of such matters, in his middle life, he believes that he is visited by the Archangel Gabriel, who gives him a message which call on all humanity to give their boundless submission to the will of a unitary God. This man and his followers have no time for the decrees of the councils of Nicaea and Chalcedon, but what they believe is not that very far from an extreme formulation of the Monophysite heresy, which is now hegemonic in Egypt and Syria. An Egypt and a Syria that repeated persecution has now made somewhat unfavourable to the idea of continued government from Constantinople. And that brings us, I suppose, on to the next episode in the history of the Byzantine Empire. That is the legacy of Justinian. There is more to it than that. You must remember the codification of Roman law, the building of all those churches, the reputation that lasted far beyond the Middle Ages for an age of literary brilliance and of achievement in every field. That is what many people believed about the age of Justinian. It really is only since the 18th century that a more hostile view has come to prevail. But although one could say a great deal more about Justinian, that's as much as I can say at the moment. So are there any questions or comments? A question. What happened in the 18th century to change perceptions of the reign of Justinian? What you have in the 18th century is an immense growth of human knowledge and the immense growth of interest in past ages and indeed other parts of the world. And you have the refinement of various tools of analysis which allow us to say things about the past that previously could not be uncovered. Until the 18th century, for example, nobody seriously worried about things like what was the population of this region at this time? If the population rose or fell, what were the causes? Things like that. And starting, I suppose, with Montesquieu, that certainly 
as we look at the works of David Hume and of course at Edward Gibbon, we begin to get a bleaker picture of the age of Justinian than had previously been believed. And of course, if you look simply at the codification of Roman law, if you look at the building of the Hagia Sophia, if you look at the expansion of imperial power throughout the Mediterranean world, you might well say it was an age of unparalleled glory. But it's when you look at what appears to have been happening with population levels, when you look, and this is much more recent stuff, at the movements of temperatures, when you look at crop yields, when you look at living standards, that's when you can see that something has gone badly wrong. Indeed, something goes so badly wrong in the 10 or 20 years after 536 that it is possible to take that as your dividing line. The ancient world ended in 536, the year without a summer, and that is the year that the Middle Ages start. I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't go into print saying that, but it is an arguable case, and it does seem that there is a fundamental transformation in the life of the Mediterranean world and its peripheries between about 535 and 565. Before then, you can move in a recognisable late antiquity. After that, you are moving in the early Middle Ages. And Justinian's own policies didn't bring that about. It was one of those external shocks that every so often come in and reset everything. Indeed, I have seen more recent articles which talk about this as a great reset. A question about the very small size of armies even before the great shock compared with the size of armies in Hellenistic and early imperial times. I don't know why the armies were so small before the Great Shock, because it doesn't seem that there had been a substantial loss of population. One possible reason is that soldiers cost a great deal more to maintain, because they were now heavily armoured and frequently mounted. The armies that Belisarius led were generally of cavalry, heavily armoured cavalry, and horses, armour, training, etc., those are all a great deal more expensive than an army of lightly armed infantry. But you see, I don't know how much more it costs to recruit and maintain a heavily armoured cavalryman. I don't know what it is. But yes, the armies were pitifully small by comparison with the kind of armies that Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar had led. But there doesn't appear before the middle of the century to have been a great drop in population. So I don't know what's happened. There is an element of mystery to all this. A discussion of the coronavirus, which appears to have a death rate of between one-tenth and one-half of one percent, and the bubonic plague, which had a death rate of about 60 percent. At the moment, if you go to a funeral, you hear the priest read out the words, man that is born of a woman hath but a short time to live and his days are full of sorrow. But for the most part, that isn't true. We don't have but a short time to live. And, well, I hope that in your case, our days are not full of sorrow. We have our ups and downs, but on the whole, life is rather pleasant. But if you go back to the time in which Thomas Cranmer wrote those words, they were entirely true and they were entirely true at all other times in the past as well. Next week, I'd like to talk about the beginning of the evil times, the great and disastrous wars with Persia at the end of the 6th, early 7th centuries. And then we, of course, need to talk about the great hammer blow of Islam. So we'll do that next week, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. So keep well, and I'll send out these slides soon. Thank you.